Uh, good morning uh, to all of you. I'd like to welcome you to the Migration Policy Institute. My name is Kathleen Newland, and I direct uh, MPI's Refugee Policy Program. Uh, today's briefing, as you know, is a discussion of the situation of Colombian refugees in Panama and Ecuador, and we are going to be discussing the observations and findings from a trip organized by the Refugee Council USA to the region. Um, and uh, two of our uh, three speakers were on that uh, mission along with uh, several others from the Jesuit Refugee Services, the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, the International Rescue Committee, uh, the Lutheran Immigration Refugee Services, Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, uh, the Canadian Council for Refugees, uh, the Women's Refugee Commission, the Episcopal Church, and the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants. So this was a very uh, wide-ranging uh, delegation that uh, visited the areas of refugee settlement in Panama and Ecuador. We are very pleased to have uh, three speakers to discuss the, the situation of Colombian refugees uh, this morning. As you know, it's uh, a very long-standing uh, refugee situation. And I think it's fair to say one of the most neglected in the wider discussion of uh, refugee problems worldwide. Uh, our panel is going to begin with Andrea Lari, who is uh, the Director of Regions at Refugees International. And he's going to uh, start by talking to us about the situation inside Colombia that is generating so much uh, displacement, both internally and externally. Uh, next, Shana Aber, uh, who's Associate Advocacy Director for Jesuit Refugee Services USA is going to talk about the situation of Colombian refugees in Panama. And Melanie Neeser, uh, Senior Director for US Policy and Advocacy at the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, is going to discuss the situation of Colombian refugees in Ecuador. Uh, you all have fuller biographies of our speakers uh, on your uh, chairs, in the material that was left on your chairs, and uh, their Accomplishments are so many and various that if I introduce them fully into our time, so I hope you'll uh, you'll forgive me for not for not doing that and refer you to the the printed bios. I also want to mention uh, that the photos we had um, uh, rotating earlier on the screen uh, were taken by uh, Refugee Council USA members on this uh, delegation to Panama and Ecuador, and also during some earlier uh, trips to the region. The pictures included images of Colombian refugees, uh, the housing they're living in, uh, the schools uh, that their, their children have access to in some cases, and the neighborhoods and communities in which these refugees are living in, in Panama and Colombia. Uh, the uh, delegation uh, in, in its uh, discussions with policymakers, with refugees, with people who are helping refugees in the region, were able to, to highlight the very complex protection issues that uh, arise in connection with Colombian refugees, their need for durable solutions, including local integration and uh, research. We saw over a period of time is that the conflict, I mean, this political, this policy and these military operations did succeed to clear several portion of the country and secure major arteries within, within the major cities in the departments, but also push the conflict much closer to the borders and much, close, much more deep into rural areas in, in Colombia. Uh, <clears throat> this is one of the reasons why the number of Colombian refugees uh, in, the la in the last few years, uh, uh, refugees that crossed cross the borders into other Ecuador, Panama, and Venezuela increased. So this dynamic of type, type of conflict that was, was happening uh, in, was and is happening in Colombia. But what kind of reasons are Colombians uh, fleeing from? What kind of causes, uh, 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 what kind of situations are causing people to cross the border? Well, it's a combination of different violent effects. Uh, some of the 
dynamics of the Colombian conflict uh, are the following. Uh, illegal armed groups, other former or reorganized or criminal gangs as they are called now, they are battling the fire for the control of other strategic areas in, in Colombia, strategic from the point of view of uh, cultivation, harvesting, uh, transiting, producing, uh, pr processing and transiting of, of illegal crops, and, and also, uh, um, and also uh, there's, there's been fighting among these groups to secure control over communities uh, for several reasons, again, for territorial control and for using uh, manpower to process illegal activities. And other reasons of the course displacement is uh, the counterinsurgency and counter narcotic policies implemented by the National Army and the police. Uh, they're actually going aggressively after those illegal armed groups, in particular the FARC and the ELN, and civilians are oftentimes uh, caught, um, caught into the crossfire. Um, there has been a, an increasing targeting of displaced communities, indigenous communities, and Afro-Colombian communities leaders by uh, these illegal armed groups. Um, displacement, forced displacement is, is a process, it's a phenomenon that has been affecting Colombia for more than 40 years. Uh, we have a recognized number of internally displaced persons of 3.670,000 3 3 people. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the official figure that the presidential agency for uh, social uh, action and international cooperation is sharing in public. The Colombian displaced have increasingly fled over the borders into neighboring countries over the last decade. Those who flee northward from the war-torn but mineral-rich Colombian Department of Choco in the northern portion of Colombia's Pacific coast, and those who depart from Buenaventura, Colombia's principal port city and also its deadliest city, often end up in Panama. While Panama is a signatory to the 1951 Convention, the 1967 Protocol, and regional instruments, including the Cartagena Declaration and the Mexico Plan of Action, it has the most exclusionary refugee policies of all of Colombia's neighbors. Um, HIAS started a program in 2003 in Ecuador, a very small program to provide psychosocial counseling to Colombian refugees in Ecuador. Um, since then, we are now providing those types of services and humanitarian assistance in nine cities throughout Ecuador. We've also established programs in Panama and Venezuela. Um, so basically, HIAS and, and JRS are the, the, the only U.S. NGOs that are providing direct services to refugees in the region. Um, and we're also, HIAS is also the implementing partner for UNHCR to do refugee resettlement from Ecuador to Argentina, which is a small program. Uh, talking about, just so you get a picture of the Colombian refugees in Ecuador, the total population of Ecuador is around 14 million. It's the most densely populated country in South America and it has a 38% poverty rate, but that's countrywide. Um, the statistics that I could find about the border, particularly for um, San Lorenzo, was a 95% poverty rate, which you could see from the pictures. I mean, it's not, um, this is not a place that has much in the way of resources. Ecuador has 50,000 refi recognized refugees, which is the highest number in Latin America. 98% are Colombian. Um, and UNHCR estimates that 135 to 160,000 Colombians in need of protection are living in Ecuador. So that's a sizable population in relation to the total population of Ecuador. The number continues to climb, as Andrea said. Um, in November, when we were there, we were told that there were 100, no, sorry, 1,000 new refugee claims every month filed in Ecuador. So um, there's no sense that this is a problem that's on the wane. And um, another thing to note is refugees in Ecuador do not live in camps anywhere in, in Ecuador. They live in communities throughout the country, and I mean everywhere throughout the country. Um, it's, most, most of the refugees are living along the border, but they are, they are everywhere. They've spread out throughout Ecuador, which makes delivering services very complicated.